All right. Um, <coughs> obviously, we're going to be I'm Scott Jackson. I oversee the interactive designers. Many of them are sitting in front of I'm Greg Ray Cornelius. I can see our students and architects within ISIS and some of the high schools and a couple of other templates from from the uh, web team on the on the application side. Can you turn up the volume? You just did. <laughs> yeah. okay. No, that's fine. That, that's gonna do it. All right. So the the uh, exactly. So the the theme of this talk we could we could go on for a long time about WordPress generally, but the theme of this talk is really about synchronizing creativity with content management and the kind of uh, conflict that exists between those two things. We did have some alternate titles. One could have been designer versus developer. We're smart versus stupid. So first, I think I want to talk about the problem between uh, creativity and content management. I think the conflict can be illustrated in a way through looking at various roles. I mean, you've seen a little of this, I'm sure, if you've sat in this since this morning, but you have um, a number of people in an organization, particularly one this size, that have to have some involvement in uh, a rollout of the CMS. In this case, we're talking about WordPress, of course, but it could be any CMS. Um, and they all have different needs. And even within each role, there's conflict. So you can think of the executive, maybe it's the president. Um, you know, if you want something that is, uh, you know, cost-effective and reliable, but you know, in contrast. They want high output, they want lots and lots of pages, lots and lots of traffic, lots and lots of shiny toys. So there's conflict there. You have a help desk who requires detailed documentation, but really they're too busy to read it, so they need quick tasks that they can execute with usable procedures. Uh, you also have editors that have uh, a need for something that's really easy, but if they're doing something specific, and you heard that from the previous talk here, they need tools that support their specific needs, so they want lots of features. I'll let Greg explain about developer needs. So, of course, the developer is going to need features to build and, uh, and uh, want to execute on those features. But at the same time, uh, we really want to have a lean code base so that upgrades are not a 10 month process. So, yeah, designers, in contrast, they need total freedom, of course, because it's not a lot to ask. But <laughs> we want to do things quickly because we don't want to be building for six months before we something interesting. Uh, so to me, the, the sort of fundamental conflict is this need for regularity versus creativity. Regularity um, sort of involves doing the same thing the same way every time, and creativity is kind of uh, creating something new every time. And I think when you put this idea of content management system in the context of higher ed, whether that be sort of a classroom or communicating for university, there's this culture of doing something different every time. Everybody's unique. Everybody wants to do something new. So this conflict plays out in all kinds of ways. Uh, and I think you know the designer ends up fighting against the machine, and the developer kind of facilitates this 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 conflict in a way. And, and we can talk about what happened when we started meddling with WordPress at a time when there is another common theme: this great organizational divide between ISCT and marketing communications. So. Yeah, so on the ISMT side, uh, what we were after uh, was really a um, uh, wanted to provide this grand service that would service everyone in the community, uh, make it really easy for them to create sites, have a very consist consistent user experience. Uh, we uh, set up support staff to be able to do training and provide uh, uh, support through a ticket tracking tra ticket tracking system. Um, and then on the Marcom side. Yeah, we have a totally different idea. <laughs> and we didn't talk about it. So this is back in sort of 2007. We had, had projects that sort of spanned the two groups, and there were sort of bad feelings about this. So we kind of fought the battle back to back, as it were. And what we thought uh, WordPress was going to be is it was going to facilitate our ability to make these stellar, grand, custom websites that could be supported by editors you know, of the particular departments. So we're thinking they're the big one-off uh, sites because it required so much more effort to make them. Um, that would be reserved uh, for, again, these, these super high priority clients. Um, and so these two things were really at odds, and we had to reconcile this during the beginning of the rollout. 
And so when, when you sort of uh, look at that alternate title of smart versus stupid, you're going to see kind of some stupid things happening in the beginning. For example, and I'll pass this right to you. And by the way, we're finishing this presentation in the back of the room, so um, this is sort of uh, our, first, our first pass at it. So we had the School of Medicine, uh, and they had they had a situation which Gregory will talk about later, but we came in first, and there was one designer, no developers involved, and no editors involved in these discussions. Really, designer talking to leadership, saying, what do you want, and designing a uh, template, <laughs> which is stupid. Uh, and they, you know, we made a template for them and said, here's your homepage, um, you know, see you later. And so then ISCT kind of comes along. So on the ISCT side, uh, you know, uh, the medical campus, they had this aging CMS that had 136 sites in it. I mean, we're talking uh, pre-DiveNet, so ASP, um, all right. tables, <laughs> yeah, lots of table layout, um, all kinds of bizarre uh, ways of constructing uh, the pages. Um, they had over 200 editors, and the task was with a really minuscule budget of, I think it was around $50,000, to migrate all this content into a new CMS. And, uh, because of the small budget, they decided uh, a decision was made to go open source and and, uh, and chose, we chose WordPress. It just happened to be that uh, the design guys were also interested in WordPress. So uh, even though uh, the two groups were at that point pretty separate, uh, we ended up uh, zeroing on, on this one product, which is the WordPress thing. So as a pilot, though. Yeah, that's not really a way to start. <laughs> so uh, a year after uh, Scott had done the design, we got started with actually this whole process of doing the uh, migration. We didn't have the designers at that point, well, they were done. Uh, but we didn't really involve the editors in that process. We actually didn't even have a true sysadmin. This was kind of done on the road. So there was an application developer who was who was a, a, a good, really strong uh, dev op, we would call and so he uh, actually spec'd out the systems and set them all up. Um, and then we had uh, another developer who's here today uh, who did the actual migration script. We did a lot of testing and, and made it happen, um, but it wasn't easy. Yeah, you, you sort of see what's coming here. <laughs> <laughs> it also was over budget. <laughs> so not only did we uh, uh, struggle to do this migration, but we did a bunch of things that um, Kind of took away a lot of what was what WordPress really is. So we got rid of comments. Well, you know, they didn't have comments before. They don't need them now. Uh, well, you know, WordPress has five roles. They really only need two roles. Let's just get rid of the other roles. Uh, categories? Uh, who needs categories? And we also got rid of tags. Too, which is, you know. <laughs> so this is all, by the way, uh, built on top of uh, WordPress MU uh, running version 2.5, so it's been a little while. So the mantra coming out of this is really, you don't want to get in a fight with WordPress. There's a lot more community members out there. Uh, it's best to try to understand it and embrace it. It's a peculiar animal, but uh, when you do so, uh, you're going to have a much, a much more successful uh, project and okay. service. Well, the age of stupid is an over, so bear with me for a minute. While they were working on this migration, there was a year after the design for medical camps, we decided, oh, we'll try another pilot. How about undergraduate admissions? Because they only get nine and a half million views a year. So we take this site, we do it with two designers because that's what we do. Um, one contractor developer who had never touched WordPress in his life. And no one from ISC, which was totally an awesome decision. <laughs> but it looked really good. Um, unfortunately, I would say this is problems in the theme and in the plugin sort of areas that are still persisting today and we're still untangling, so we're going to have to fix that starting in September. We had another pilot shortly after that with the student resources, which is always in the top five to ten websites at PU. Um, we, had, we did that with two students. <laughs> yeah, we, didn't, we didn't actually hire a developer, and I literally sat over somebody's shoulder. And I hate to do this because one of the students is right there, you know, working her. She's not stupid, it was stupid on my part. Have her do this for so long. So anyway, that was awesome. But again, the design looked pretty good. It's still an effective website. I'm gonna point out that there's some zipper for primary navigation. Yeah, and I, I spent about a year having to clean up various little problems with the team after the fact. So at various points, you know, the HR folks would discover, oh, this doesn't work the way it should. Okay. Exactly. So clean up. The price you pay for not planning ahead, which we have learned, can be heavy. So uh, certainly.
sort of last um, sort of project I wouldn't consider as a pilot, this is really what happened when um, we began to sort of treat WordPress as a service. We got some calls from my team, which is great because we should be talking about this. Like, you know, we need some templates, we're going to use them as some basic things. So it's okay, I'm here. Sort of a, a side project that we spent very little time on, hand over some files. So we spent very little time on it, uh, handed over to a developer, didn't really coordinate, and we watched as uh, the initial rollout of WordPress went from zero to 136 sites with the medical campus. Shortly after that, the beginning of 2009, we had 141 sites, which isn't such a big growth. You know, some of those are additions in HR, but all of a sudden, yeah. So with the rollout and the set of three themes and a, a cool kind of process and actually in a way a marketing campaign saying, hey, go go uh, migrate to WordPress. Uh, you know, demand was huge and it just blew up. And uh, we ended up with 342 sites as of ugly, ugly websites with really lame names. So if you fast forward today, we have 581 sites. We'll get to sort of what happened there. But uh, if you actually add in the in-progress sites that we have in our pre-production area plus the blogs, we actually are running, running 2,732 WordPress sites at BU right now, which is a staggering number when you think of the scale of the staff. We're often accused of having sort of the biggest staff around in higher ed, but we have this huge demand for service, which is still hard for us to keep up with. So this sort of prompted um, us to do a little math. And since 2008, we've created almost two sites a day, um, which led to the ocean moment. <laughs> this actually happened probably back in, in 2009. And fortunately, in retrospect, we really started planning ahead a little bit better then. And we're, we're entering a new age, hopefully, at this point in this talk. Um, but we realized uh, at that point, um, yeah, sort of in the mid-2009, these roles really had to, had to come together. And I think the key is, uh, it's, and it's not optional, you, you really have to respect and understand what the needs and contributions of all these people are that sort of work in this space. Um, and I think, as an example, um, you know, the designers and developers need to sort of advocate for one another and one another's needs, but uh, the designer has to understand what the editor is capable of because you might be handing over a site that, uh, you know, for whom the editor does not understand HTML, <laughs> can't write it. So um, the, the developer needs to sort of understand the help desk's needs so they don't overburden them. Uh, and so we kind of got to this point and sort of went back to, you know, how do you make a great site in the CMS? And you have to take good content, you have to take good design, good tools, and that's when you get a great website. Yeah, and I think that this is a little bit different when you have a CMS in the equation than when you're building static websites, where with a static website, uh, the tools are, uh, they, they're sort of uh, not a big part of the equation really are dealing with just uh, text files and it's really laborious to edit it but uh, the tools are not near as important as they become when you're dealing with the CMS. That's right. So you could make beautiful sites prior to WordPress but they stay sort of stagnant and die a slow death because nobody would update them. So we enter the age of collaboration so this is more or less where we are now and it's not perfect but from this um, from this time we get some of the work that you probably see uh, and it goes with these websites. So this was sort of up earlier in someone else's presentation, which I find flattering. Um, this was a designer um, and a developer in our office who created, um, you know, really sort of rich media uh, content. Uh, and it's, it's using just a page template uh, within a WordPress site, but it's an example of uh, doing something in a different way in a WordPress website. We have uh, the international programs site which involve not only an interesting way to sort of draw people in by making the decisions that excite them about studying abroad. We did it with video wallpaper and a sort of flash banner on the front page, but it was supported in the background um, by a custom taxonomy solution so that we could provide multiple entry points into discovering what particular program is best suited to meet your needs as a student. So, you could go in uh, looking for something based on location, or you could go in based on your interest area. So maybe I'm looking specifically for engineering. So it, uh, I think it was really successful. Yeah, uh, and, that, and, they're, and they're, you know, their uh, their business is benefiting from a good website. You can measure that. <coughs> we also have the College of Fine Arts website, and this is an interesting one because this is based on a product just later that allows.
allow the design effort to really rapidly make this happen. Right, yeah, and it's a large site, it's over a thousand pages, so uh, there's a, a lot of content to deal with, but um, nonetheless, because it was uh, in this original form, well structured, we were able to, to really move pretty quickly to get it into, into the CMI. So since then, they've been able to update much, much more rapidly than they did when it was a static website. And I should underscore the point I made earlier. In these projects, we had the editors in the room, we had the executives in the room, we had the designers, the developers, uh, and in some cases, we also involved the QA. So we have all these people from across departments who are sort of figuring out, hey, you know, this isn't a service we can offer alone. This is something that we have to do together to do it well. Uh, we have Metropolitan College. Um, yeah, done by. And, and this really uh, uh, is, is emblematic of that. that um, multiple groups of people because we also were uh, pointing course data from our course database um, and integrating that in the website because the Metropolitan College, they offer uh, sort of a la carte courses. Uh, so it's for, um, for evening classes and, and uh, non-degree students. Uh, there are some degree students, but they have a special need. Right, it's more like a retail-facing business where they have Courses, it's a, it's a big course catalog, has programs, sort of all the taxonomies as well. And then we have kind of really glossy websites that promote research, which use um, you know some similar frameworks. This was designed prior to uh, implementing some products on the internet, but then sort of merged with those recently. Um, and we have you know, designs that are not burdened by uh, the need to um, do things the same way every time. That's the liberation for us design. Uh, we have Sergeant mm -hmm. Choice, which is you know, a handful of retail products, the site uh, about sort of nutrition, food products. We have schools and colleges using uh, some of the same sort of tools. This was also mentioned earlier. We have college presentation, which is um, you know, done by one of our designers that is traditionally not feeling bound by the rules of the CMS. So you kind of cut loose, and we sort of learn from that experience right now. So we have to uh, we have to be mindful of those connections and that workflow when we do anything. But again, it's nice to be able to support that kind of creative freedom. So this is a more blog-like section within that. Um, lots of interesting stuff happened. And then we recently, last year, launched our <coughs> university-wide course catalog in WordPress. I'll try to mention a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, they decided to do away with the printed course catalog or bulletins, as we refer to it. Um, and uh, one of the challenges of this is that there are approximately 10,000 courses that are a part of that catalog. Well, uh, when we went out and started the project, there was someone that really wasn't uh, super new to WordPress as, a, as far as uh, development is concerned. And his solution was to create individual pages for each one of those courses. Well, that didn't really work. So uh, we. Uh, at kind of towards the end, um, use uh, some little clever development stuff where you can use what's called WP Rewrite uh, to be able to load uh, uh, this external content into the WordPress frame without having individual pages or posts to, to actually contain that content. So um, it, it worked really quite well. So this is our getting ready for the second release this, this fall. That's right. Well, Gregory should skip over the fact that this probably does deserve another, another stupid tag. We're going to make it smart or stupid. Um, the, the, the thought was, oh, we're just going to make you know, 10, 20,000 pages in WordPress, because WordPress is really great with lots of pages. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, it literally just brought everything to a grinding halt when we got around the sort of 5,000 page mark. Yeah. And even before that. So, uh, that's a lesson learned. And then there's this one. Yeah, so this is just a great example of how important it is to eat your own dog food. So, uh, we uh, built uh, the ISNT website inside of WordPress, which is a very large site. There are maybe, I think, 2,200 pages. Um, there was a lot of uh, hiccups along the way constructing that, but it really does uh, force the, the, the staff to actually really dig in and deal with some of these problems that also will crop up with other folks as they're using it. So um, it's always a good idea to keep your own dog food. That's this thing. So, so that's the tech one. Uh, so what we basically arrived at after kind of doing this for a while was this idea that of, of sort of having a range of offerings. 
almost all of these are partner services campuses. You have designers from here, you have editors out in the community, you have um, you know, developers and sysadmins and other people in, in the ISMP. And so you kind of go from some of those sites that we just looked at, which are fully custom in many cases. Um, and then we have sort of the quick setup sites, which <laughs> involve maybe a few weeks of, of work, and maybe you're really just cleaning up some of the messy website. And then you have DIY tools, which you can offer freely to the community. And remember that, that sort of growth spurt that we had uh, between 2008 and 2009 was really fueled by this desire, this demand for DIY tools. Uh, this is a really big community. Nobody really wants to wait in the line. So if you have something that can be more or less um, set up by a help desk, uh, and people can just go ahead and publish and build websites and do it easily. You know, that's actually what accounts for the vast number of sites that we have. So it's a smart idea to create this range. I think you can map that, obviously, to sort of high cost, uh, moderate cost, and low cost offerings. And it's the way we sustain uh, demand or we barely sustain. Yes. So you can't support you know, 2,000 plus custom sites that are high cost, high effort, and that's obvious, but uh, it, it wasn't obvious to us. Uh, so the other thing we had to do was set up with load knowledge. Right. So one of the big challenges right, is to get these two different offices to really work together and synchronize. And um, you know, we're not in the same physical location. The cultures are quite different. Um, the designers, it's a little bit like a playground. The IT guys are a little bit too serious sometimes. Um, and you know, the designers' office is really bright and light and airy. The, IT office looks like a dungeon. He's jealous. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, so so some things that we've done to actually zero everything together is one, we share a, a, a sandbox. So uh, we have a single development server. Everyone does the work, their work in this development server. So uh, that means that uh, there's uh, top conversations that have to happen to make that work. Uh, we also all use Subversion, which as uh, some of the designers in the, uh, the office uh, would definitely say, uh, it was not their favorite tool to adopt. But what it does, cost for design. <laughs> <laughs> but but what it does do is uh, just put. Yeah, it also puts us on the same page and requires communication to have, have that all happen. For those of you who don't know, Subversion is a code management tool so that people working in lots of different locations can submit and create their code to the central place. Where it's all kind of put together and tracked. You know, in fact, the previous version supported that. Yeah, and at this point, in the, the three years, we're actually above 10,000 commits to our sandbox, and that's just WordPress. Uh, so it's a lot of work. Uh, and then the next thing that we uh, try to emphasize is always hard is that documentation. And we do that in a shared spot so that it's accessible to everyone. Um, and then finally, uh, collaboration tools. So we use an IRC channel to be able to communicate. Across the groups, and I think that that's been pretty helpful. Except, except if you wander into the designer and IRC channel, which is just for the kids. We call it the giggle corner. So, so we also have uh, a particular setup in terms of how we move code and how we move content. So, to actually create true sandboxes um, that are are disconnected from production, so you can actually do stuff and not worry that, oh, I just accidentally deleted a chunk of the database that uh, represents our production websites. Um, so we have sandboxes, and then we have a devil area that's kind of shared across the university. Uh, and we have a staging area where uh, content is produced in advance of uh, the, the launch of the site and we have production. Uh, and then uh, as far as the content is concerned, so that's the way that we move code. Um, the, the sequence of, of steps that code moves through. Uh, on the other end, uh, we can pull down content from production into a, any of our sandboxes through uh, a little tool that we create, uh, which allows the designers to develop and the developers to develop the theme around real content. So the content work and the development work can happen in sync with one another. The content folks can be uh, uh, in the uh, in the staging area working on the content, and then we can pull down fresh copy of the content so that up with uh, the development. Yeah. And that, again, that just saves time because the, you know, the, the command that's at this point is running a script and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I don't know what he does mainly, but it supports our workflow. So we, <laughs> we basically take these sites and bring them into uh, our own sandboxes and play with them until they look right. And then we 
and they code back up to the uh, you know the, the pre-production areas or the Zenith production areas. And so we have this workflow that's really uh, cyclical and actually works. So this is your slide. Yeah, so not only is it important to have tools and a, and a set of workflows that's shared, but it's also important to assemble teams that really do cross the boundaries and not start from, you know, just have the design happen at the beginning and then, uh, you know, okay, well, design's done, now we move to development by trying to have a team that is established at the beginning and even if the developers are not necessarily involved in the design per se, at least there's a little bit of touch points happening throughout the process so that you don't end up in a situation where uh, a designer has created something that's basically unbuildable in the time frame that, that the project has laid out for itself. Yeah, again, you know, I'm just defending the workflow of designers here, but it's, you know, I've always said that design is the process of discovery, and it's iterative. So at every iteration, you discover something new that you might not be able to develop. So this is something that we always have to go back and forth on. And, you know, the joke about being awkward is sometimes you have to compromise in order to meet the limits. Can you speak into the microphone? Sure. So again, just kind of getting into this, um, this, this sort of range of offerings, we have to come up with ways to do all of this and scan do-it-yourself sites, do-it-yourself tools to custom sites. And these tools um, have been developed and, and we basically created, um, at least on one, in one area, this thing we call flexible theme framework. We never say that, we actually call it flexi. So this is the word we use. Flexi is basically um, the, the basis for our, most of our theme creation. In some cases, we don't use it because we're doing something fully really custom. But we found that in most cases, it covers our needs and allows us to work faster. So just a little explanation to show and tell about what this is. You have, obviously, color options, particularly with DIY sites. You have you know, white, blue, we have a lot of blue sites with like this. We call them stupid names. Um, this, this one is called Flexi Comap, this one is called Flexi Cobalt. You get the idea, they're stupid names. Everybody rolls their eyes. Um, Flexi Top Floor, that's what that one is. Oh, and my, one of my favorites, Flexi Gazelle. She's right over there. Uh, not the gazelle design. Uh, and then within those those sort of things, we have uh, lots of sort of plugins and extensions that allow us to change the framework according to the need of the site. And do it yourself, site owners can change the theme according to their needs. So we have this, uh, this content banner, which um, is not only something that we can span full window with, page with, for uh, content with a content hall that we can actually substitute for all HTML. So if we want to have sort of a, a rich experience with Flash or with something um, using uh, JavaScript animations, we can do that in a space that's just the content banner. And it's, and it's a plugin that was designed so that the actual positions that, that are listed in the admin are defined in the theme. So uh, for example, we're working on a new project that has a fourth position, uh, which is inline. So uh, one of the things that I've been uh, doing is trying to uh, add configuration options that uh, for plugins that can be set in the theme so that uh, there can be some additional flexibility at the level of the development slash design without having to kind of refactor the, the actual tool. That's right. So we have this um, layout editor in addition, which within the admin you can have one column with uh, multi-column what we call foot bar, which is the widget area below uh, the content. You can have Move the sidebar from other sides. You can have a maximum width one with two sidebars. Split the sidebars. Move the foot, you know, the width areas around. And we do this really easily in the admin. And it looks kind of like this. So, lots of possibilities when you have what is basically a starter kit for designing. You can make it look however you want for the most part. It is a little markup heavy because frameworks by their nature have to have lots of containers, but uh, that's really the only complaint that we have in our you know, uh, code gurus. So another aspect of this. Yeah, so as part of the service, we have a series of these uh, themes that are, that are generally available, and we have automated this setup. Um, we also try to set defaults to, I think, that we think are most likely to service the, the folks that are using uh, it. And I think, by and large, now that we have all the automated tools, when, it, when we first launched uh, Flexi, we didn't have the automated tools, and the, the help desk was screaming for help because 
Uh, they were getting lots of requests. They wanted to switch off the, uh, the, the old default themes to this new set of themes. And uh, the, there was a lot of little configuration steps. And so we uh, put effort into uh, improving that so that it could happen quickly. Right. And where does the help desk go when they need help? Nobody knows. Right. <laughs> so then there are logo variants as part of the automatic setup. Because these themes are different colors, they have different backgrounds, they have different uh, entity types, if you want to kind of consider our, our terminology, we have to have these automated uh, these sites. And I'm sure developers right here have worked on this. And it's not really easy to sort of handle this. But by providing certain information during the setup, you can make them generate the logos automatically certain of the uh, sites, and this is pretty sophisticated automation. Um, and you can talk about this. Yes, yeah, so the basis of YC is really uh, the parent-child uh, architecture that WordPress uh, provides. Um, then we also, as I was mentioning with the content banner, we try to make our plugins extensible so that you can make little adjustments so that if a designer really wants, for example, we have this post widget that shows recent posts, maybe they don't, they want to show a thumbnail with the post, or maybe they want it to be, I, I don't know, they want the gate to be really prominent. Whatever it is, uh, the, the theme can change how that plugin renders its uh, its uh, content markup. Uh, so that allows for flexibility without having to build a new plugin or write new documentation to the help desk. So here's just another example. This site is actually based on Flexi, but includes a whole pile of customizations on top of it for, for streaming and uh, uh, menus and so forth. So just kind of um, moving through some of these other things, which we'll sort of get to and then have for questions. We'll also um, have a, a way of splitting the themes um, and, and passing uh, small screen devices to the mobile version of the site. This was a pilot we've done. We're also working on the next uh, version. This is the bus site. Again, it has a corresponding mobile site. And then we have plugins. I'm not sure we have time to sort of dig in too much. But um, we can publish this, uh, this document if you guys want to. Yeah, so we, you know, it doesn't happen without a bunch of plugins. Probably the, the most uh, widely used and most useful is this new navigation plugin that allows us to uh, handle the issue of dealing with lots and lots of pages and changing the organization of those pages. Um, and then this is kind of a peek into the admin. Um, and then uh, the other ones that are really important to us, the gravity forms. People love to build forms, um, and this makes it really easy for folks so we don't have deal with much in the way of support in terms of the construction of the forms. We also have a tool for being able to define access control lists and applying them to a particular page, and that page is children, to media items, uh, to the entire website. So it's a, a really useful for cases where you need stuff that needs to be uh, protected for a certain segment of the community. Uh, and then uh, we also do lots of integration with other uh, applications so we have integration with the view calendar. We do integration with view maps um, and then other applications in between our emergency alert system. All right, so just uh, so we can jump into questions, uh, what we're working on now is a larger world on mobile websites um, as a service and also for custom applications. We're working on the main new site, which is enormous, we're migrating that data, cleaning it up in the process, creating a new team that has lots of custom work there. We're working on libraries, which is an enormous website. Uh, that's going to integrate it with sort of um, new search tools that they've licensed. Uh, we're working on magazine frameworks because we publish a lot of magazines online. We've been publishing, publishing more. And we're also going to introduce some, some responsive designs, going like Flexi, which is really setting a single layout. We're going to have some multi layout uh, versions. And then we're really kind of at a point where we think uh, we'd like to get back to the WordPress community, and that's just not gapping at you like this. But also, uh, bring some code up there. Yeah, yeah, it's starting to share some of our tools. Um, so, so, hopefully, in the next six months, we'll be able to get, get the, all the policy and legal things uh, taken care of so we can do so. So, that's right. So, we have a couple of minutes for questions because we talk too much. Please stand up and uh, speak into the microphone, please. Sure, go ahead. Hi, you had mentioned uh, earlier on that uh, one of your sites that had 5,000 pages kind of roughly stands to the full. I'm wondering how you solve that. 5,000 pages doesn't sound like, I mean, it's a large site, but it doesn't sound like it's absolutely enormous. It certainly sounds like something WordPress ought to be able to handle. 
Well, in that particular case, we didn't solve it at the WordPress layer. So uh, actually, WordPress, yeah, I would agree. I wish that it would handle that kind of uh, page, that number of pages. But there are issues with uh, how it handles hierarchical content. Um, if you're dealing with posts, it's fine. But with pages, there's some, there's some gotchas in there. Um, and so I, that's one thing as far as the WordPress community and, and our involvement um, that we're looking to, to work on correcting um, and, and finding out what other people's experiences are and just come up with a really good solution for it. Um, but in that particular case, like I was, I was trying to explain, it was all uh, course pages that were pulling in data from our course database. So really we didn't need the pages in WordPress. We could just go directly, get that content from the course database and put it in the WordPress frame. So, uh, and we did so in such a way that it still uh, got cached by our super cache for them. So, next question. Hi, um, I'm Scott Bacor from uh, the Center for Global Health and Development at Boston University. We, um, congratulations on building the site. I came after the site was built. I was recently at a trade, um, a trade show for the global health community. And we didn't, we didn't get it, we didn't, we just, we got so many good compliments on the website. People have been actually interacting much more, um, getting access to, to publications. We have this great publication site where you can search by all these different categories. Um, and we just started using, um, the question I have is about the, we're using one of the DIY sites for an intranet. We're kind of training the whole group. There's about 50 people in, in, here in Boston and about 150 people around, um, around the world. And we want to kind of do more with an intranet where there's much more possibility of collaboration. Have you guys explored? Um, I know that with Drupal, you can do video conferencing. You can, there's, there's these things you can put. Have you guys explored more um, activity-based um, sites in WordPress or an intranet? Well, I think um, that's interesting you say that. We have in, uh, recently begun our own version of uh, a P2 child theme. I don't know if you experiment with P2, but it's basically like uh, a WordPress theme that, that is like an activity stream, not like a Twitter stream or Facebook stream, which can post videos. There are post formats out of like Tumblr. So P2 is a really cool theme. We've been doing some customizations. Our next key is going to be kind of tying that more seamlessly into web login. So the answer is yes. And I'm going to talk about why about that. Yeah, and just in general, um, you know, one thing that we've had to do is going back all the way to the UMC, we have these customizations that were put in place to uh, really focus on this particular problem, which was sort of uh, delivering page-based hierarchical content. And uh, we're this right now we're in an upgrade cycle, and we're trying to to clean up and 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 remove some of that restrictive aspect, so that we can then offer things that that are maybe more blog-oriented or more. Um, so we talked about uh, something along the lines of. of, of uh, course blogs, course tools, stuff like that. I mean, just more broad use of WordPress to solve more problems as opposed to just uh, this particular departmental site problem. Yep. Yeah. Um, before you switch to WordPress, I, I imagine you had a lot of um, sort of legacy code. And I'm just wondering, uh, now that you're in WordPress, is everyone developing in like PHP, or does the people uh, in the university that are working with the websites, do they still use .NET and those other kind of Windows-based technologies, or does everyone have to migrate over to uh, PHP? Uh, so as far as web applications are concerned, um, there is, and there's kind of a split between the core business of the university, which has uh, some web views into actually what um, a lot of the data is and uh, tools are in our mainframe, actually. So there's a Perl, a whole set of Perl stuff. Then um, on the web side, um, the applications are primarily PHP, but we also have, uh, we're starting to move into using uh, Python and Django. Uh, so for more traditional web application development type stuff. There are folks that still have, that are doing web, Windows development in other areas, and that it's a university, so it's very decentralized. There's lots of folks that are doing their own thing, and I don't have any idea what they're using to do that. But, um, but these, these things don't integrate with each other, do they? I mean, well, they're, I, 
I mean, uh, we're entering into a world where APIs, um, we're building RESTful APIs to be able to communicate across applications, various techniques for, for handling inter application uh, data sharing and communication. Um, so we, you know, we were doing some of that with our own stuff, but uh, you know, you can uh, there's RSS and XML and JSON and all these different ways that we can um, share data across the bridge. It's just become the performance. The performance is a tricky thing to figure out. You guys uh, you mentioned some kind of free quality assurance in the beginning. Can you talk about the whole quality assurance and maybe like ticket tracking and you know some of your requests to uh, you even like a new logo, if you have a system for that, or they find a bug where they put something inside the put up your product to Walmart? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's two sides to it. We have uh, the um, uh, incident slash service request uh, tool, which uh, has now just been moved to uh, this thing called, uh, it's a hosted service called ServiceNow, um, and that's shared across all of IT, and actually there are various partners uh, throughout campus that also have adopted it. Um, so that's handled for things like help desk support. Um, tickets go to a tier one level, which is a help desk staff that then can escalate it to the web team that's within the application development side if there's something that can't resolve. Uh, then on the development side, we use a bug tracker. We're using Track, which is the same bug tracker that the core WordPress folks use. Um, and we, the QA folks enter tickets into that. Um, so we have a phase, of, uh, especially any project that has heavy development, where QA uh, tests out, makes sure that the features are working correctly, and they submit tickets into the track, and that's the kind of workflow. I think this is probably the whole time we have, right? Yeah, I think it's so. lunchtime. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.